What Vladimir Putin is doing today, these past weeks, brings shame on the memory of the millions of people, the millions of Russians, who sacrificed in the name of freedom. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau there alongside Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky visiting Ukraine. It was a surprise visit and happened a day before Russia's so-called Victory Day celebration, which marks the defeat of the Nazis in World War II. With the Prime Minister in that uh, shot, as you see on the TV ahead of you, raising the Canadian flag at the embassy in Kyiv, announcing the embassy's reopening, was also Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie, and Canada's ambassador to Ukraine, Larissa Galadza. I asked Minister Jolie what she didn't realize about the war before her visit this weekend. I think that intellectually I, I, I understood what was going on, but it's nothing like meeting the people who are on the front lines and, and, and connecting with them and understanding their emotions. It was, it was um, st stunning and shocking. Um, and at the same time, there's so much great resilience shown by the people of Ukraine from the mayor of Irpin who helped evacuate 50,000 people of his city to the president, Vladimir Zelensky himself, who's shown great, uh, tremendous leadership in, in this entire uh, unjustifiable invasion by Russia. That was Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie. The trip, the visit she made to Ukraine alongside the Prime Minister, it was a surprise trip, but it wasn't necessarily a surprise to some. Have a listen. We did know two weeks ago that he was going. Uh, there had been rumors that uh, the JTF2 had been set up to clear a path for him over there. So uh, I guess the prime minister felt he needed to do that, and it was his prerogative as prime minister to do it. So what kind of security preparations went into the trip or could have gone into the trip? Steve Day is a former commander with Canada's Joint Task Force 2 Special Forces Unit. He's now president of Radical Ventures Canada. Steve, good to have you back on the show, as always. Thanks for making the time. Actually, great to be back with you. So that was a conservative MP saying that they had been made aware of some, you know, pre kind of like a visit two weeks before to essentially suss out what the security situation would be like. We know there had been some politicians from other countries visiting. Uh, my colleague Katie Simpson is reporting that some calls were made from the government here to officials in those countries that had already made a visit. From your perspective, what goes into figuring it out, figuring out if a place like Kiev is safe enough to visit? Well, what's interesting, Vash, we, we have a saying in the special operations community, time equals options. <clears throat> so therefore, if the special operations community or any security actor has plenty of time and warning, it allows us to build uh, different pathways and options to achieve the objective of the visit. So it doesn't surprise me that they would have had two to three weeks notice. That would be expected. It allows, like I said, those operators to get on the ground, have a look around, suss out the, the threat, the adversary threat, the environmental threats, and then have conversations, like you said, other government of officials, government to government, and with security actors who are on the ground. And, and can you expand a little bit on that last point? Like, what do you do once you're on the ground? And my understanding is, for example, you've done that for visits of the governor general to a certain place. Like, what are you looking for on the ground to determine whether or not this is a safe place? Well, you need to think about ingress routes, egress routes. If something goes wrong, where are you going to find safe haven and shelter? What type of medical facilities are proximate in case you have a, a medical uh, event? And then communications. How, is, how easy is it to speak within your team or back to Canada or to your other uh, brother and sister security actors that are in that environment? And from what you see, obviously we're not privy to all the intelligence that, that they are, but from what we can see on the outside, we know Russian forces have retreated from Kyiv for the most part. Uh, we know that a number of other embassies have been set up, that other politicians were there. If you were to look from the outside and make that assessment, is it reasonable to ascertain that, yes, look, there, there probably is a way to do this? Oh, there, there's absolutely a way to do this. And and I was uh, always questioning why the embassies had been closed in the first place. I was never a believer that that was the right strategic move. And certainly now in May, at day 75 plus, I'm convinced that those Western embassies must be open. And why, why do you think that's important? Well, it, it demonstrates resolve, first of all, that the West and other, the rest of the globe is with Ukraine in this fight. 
And quite frankly, it also makes it more difficult for Russia to drop bombs on Kyiv when uh, Western and other government uh, um, embassies are open and active. So it just, it's a bit of a deterrent, a strategic deterrent, but at the same time, it allows the necessary business of government and statecraft to happen. I also wanted to get your input on the broader issue of Russia's military strategy right now. And your impression, for example, of the speech that kind of wasn't, you know, that Victory Day speech that so many analysts had predicted would include a generalized declaration of war on Ukraine, if not something worse, didn't end up materializing. Yes, Vladimir Putin blamed the West, blamed NATO, but things that, that we had heard before, even the parade itself looked scaled down from what might have been expected. What do you read into that? Well, again, I think what I'm my my key takeaway is is this is a conflict of Vladimir Putin's choosing, and only he knows what he's going to do. And so, anybody out there that believes that they're inside Vladimir Putin's head, I, I would seriously question whether that's true or not, because he is the person that is holding all the decisions about when this will terminate and on what conditions. Clearly, in consultation and negotiation with the Ukrainians. But I'll tell you, the hand that he's currently playing is not very strong. And what do you think that means for that term stalemate that we are hearing, I would say, more frequently bandied about right now? Uh, do you think it applies or could apply in this case? I, I absolutely believe this could turn into a frozen conflict in the East, where basically the, the Russians simply do not have the conventional military combat power to win on the ground. Now again, nuclear, chemical, biological weapons are absolutely a game changer, but if you look at what the Ukrainian military has been able to do and stand toe-to-toe -to -toe and face-to-face -face against, generally speaking, a larger Russian military, I think we're, we're into a frozen conflict. And again, I wouldn't be surprised if we're not talking about this exact same thing next May 9th. Okay. Thanks very much, Steve. I'll leave it there. Appreciate your insights as always. Thank you, Vashi. Have a great night. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.